Okay, well, welcome everybody and thank you for joining us today. Uh, it's really terrific to be with you again. Uh, Dr. Weiniger Cohen had encouraged me to, to make sure we included some COVID-19 presentations during the course of the academic semester. And we're really thrilled to have Dr. Craig Katz with us today, who is a professor in the Department of Psychiatry, a professor in the Department of Global, Global Health, and associate professor in the Department of Medical Education, all at the Icon School of Medicine at Mount Sinai. Also the founder and director of the program in global mental health for the Mount Sinai Health System. Dr. Katz received his Bachelor of Arts in Philosophy from Harvard, and then his MD from PNS at Columbia University, and then a prelim year in medicine, uh, near and dear to our hearts, mm -hmm. as well as a residency in psychiatry at PNS, so the chief resident year at, at PNS. And then followed that with a fellowship at NYU in psychiatry and the law and finally completed his training in, at the Psychoatlantic Institute at Columbia, completing a training in psychoanalysis um, in that really esteemed program that goes back, I think, more than 100 years, Dr. Katz. Yes. In the years since then, he's had a remarkable career to me as a clinical researcher and educator and uh, has made an impact really across the globe as it relates to the the mental health impacts of human trauma and tragedy. Uh, for example, in the context of bioterrorism, airline accidents, uh, experiences of bias in the, in the gay male and lesbian communities, homelessness, poverty. And in, in the more recently in patients, uh, people seeking asylum and the impacts of child separations. He led New York City's efforts around the response in the aftermath of 9-11 as it related to the psychiatric impacts. And most importantly, of course, for our talk today, um, thinking about the mental health impacts of the experience of pandemics, for example, Ebola, and of course, COVID-19. Dr. Katz is internationally recognized for his work and has done important work in Belize, Japan, Haiti, Sri Lanka, and of course in the United States. And it's really a pleasure for us, Dr. Katz, to have you with us and welcome. Well, thanks, that's a very kind introduction. I do appreciate it and thank you all for uh, uh, inviting me and, and uh, I'll, I'll jump right into it, so thank you. Um, so, um, yeah, so we'll take a kind of a, a stroll through what we know about the psychosocial aspects of um, uh, infectious outbreaks going from the Middle Ages up till now, COVID-19. And so we'll have a historical perspective uh, as, as much as we know uh, from the past. We'll talk, I'll talk a bit about what we know so far about COVID-19, which of course is unfolding as we speak and try to draw some implications. So yeah, this is the outline. Um, I'm gonna start way back at the Black Plague and then take us all the way up to, to the present day and hit on a few um, key, key events over the years, mostly in the, the 20th and now 21st century. Um, I do some consulting work um, for uh, a, fire, a center for traumatized firefighters and with a, uh, a crisis network around the country. Those are my disclosures. So the Black Plague in the uh, mid 1300s. Um, so yeah, this, this was a particularly uh, devastating event and uh, hopefully one that we're not gonna come anywhere close to, uh, to uh, matching uh, in terms of mortality and et cetera in the current uh, pandemic. But um, uh, you know, this was uh, bubonic, pneumonic, septicemic plague. Um, you know, um, <clears throat> almost, I think it's estimated almost half of the European population was killed and of course, at the time, the issue was there really was no any medical science and the idea of public hygiene and sanitation were really not known or appreciated. And, you know, in terms of the sort of psychosocial response to the, whoops, sorry, to the event, um, the, uh, you know, and, and I'll try to kind of compare and contrast with, with what we are experiencing now, there was quite a bit of social, social isolation and avoidance from one's community. Uh, there was fear. There was actually, uh, you know, people staying scared to be around the sick. They didn't really understand what was happening. There was flight from countries, revelry and lawlessness to the extent that the history books are accurate. And, uh, you know, this is, I think, fairly different from what we, we're experiencing these days. Um, in fact, 
it seems like the challenge in, in the COVID-19 pandemic has actually been that uh, people don't want to put up with social isolation um, or that the extent that we have social isolation is a public health mandate, uh, not, not something done out of fear necessarily. Um, uh, yeah, and this, this is just a, a quote that kind of gets at it, um, but even talking about families abandoning one another out of fear. Um, and so, you know, very, very, uh, you know, again, if the history books are to be believed, a very frightening uh, time, and it sounds like a very, very chaotic time where people really were lost, particularly lost, society was lost. Uh, so there was, you know, quite a bit of uh, <clears throat> economic disruption in what was at the time a primarily agricultural um, society. On the other hand, um, there were some positives that came out of it. And um, you know, inevitably, thankfully, I think there's usually good that comes from bad, we hope. Um, so there was actually, uh, there was sort of more of a, a leveling of society and an empowering of, of the serf and the lower classes at the time. And uh, also the plague people learn from it and they began to get it, have a notion of public health approaches and have starting to develop the idea of having a public health authority to try to avoid such such things um, such events in the future and at least such levels of disruption so some good came from that and then there's the uh, the pandemic uh, the flu pandemic in uh, in the early 1900s that we hear a lot about these days right so <clears throat> considered one of the greatest natural disasters in history and over 50 million people died, you know, so maybe about a fifth, twentieth of the whole of the world's population. It's not clear, you know, everything that we can draw from that and from an infectious diseases perspective, as I understand it. But um, it's very interesting because the government's response at the time um, was to uh, avoid making public pronouncements and. Uh, even as it was spreading before people's eyes, the government, President Wilson, apparently made a policy decision not to, not to say much, and uh, and public health officials, I think, sort of following that tune, tended to minimize or under, under underestimate the risk and overstate their knowledge, and uh, newspapers seemed to go along with this too, and either were silent or offered false reassurance, or so you had either silence or false reassurance. And uh, this was uh, the, the message from a, uh, an official in Chicago, um, right? Worry kills more than the disease. And um, you know, what, you ha what happens when you have you know, a lack of information, right? Is r rumors swirl uh, and people start, you know, you know, deciding for themselves what to do in a pot pot potentially herky-jerky uh, fashion. Um, there was, you know, reports of the sick going uncared for, um, and uh, you know, people fearing eating together, kissing, which actually might have been quite wise, actually, um, kind of you know, coming to uh, intuitive conclusions on their own. Uh, and it, it had seemed that cities where there was more direct communication about risk um, did a whole lot better than those that did not. Um, and and you know, the the healthcare system at the time was near collapse, and there certainly this may have been also some effect of World War One. There was a lot of absenteeism. Um, uh, the railroad system had became paralyzed. Um, uh, phone system became weakened. Stores refused to open. Again, some of this, you know, you know, in terms of stores not opening, right? There are parallels to today, except today stores not did not open mostly, right, because of policy decisions made by by governors um, and not uh, people just kind of doing it on their own. <clears throat> so there was a sense that society was just kind of drifting and kind of randomly finding its way without the in the absence of government leadership which again, um, without getting into politics, you can try to, you can maybe draw some conclusions uh, about the, um, our government's approach to COVID-19, at least if at the federal level, uh, there are some, I think, definite similarities, a, a difference from what I can tell so far, and maybe you would agree is that at least at the government, at the go governor's level, at the state level, there's been more activism and uh, more clear if policy decisions, even if people disagreed with them. Uh, this picture now would seem very familiar to us, even if the uh, the attire is different, but this is for the Seattle police back in 1918. And uh, so I think um, the San Francisco, I think, was considered a city that was much more proactive and communicative about the, the outbreak, whereas Philadelphia, I think, apparently was, was a contrast. And so um, there it was felt that a lot more chaos broke out in, in Philadelphia compared to a city like San Francisco. 
lessons learned, uh, right? Well, this is where, you know, um, social distancing that we talk about today, um, maybe still better to be called physical distancing, uh, was found to be one of the most effective measures for, for reducing the spread. Um, and they acquired more experience with public health measures and then, you know, the idea of applying them early. And that truth telling by the government and being forthright by the government is essential for reducing panic. Those were some of the lessons uh, learned. We jump way ahead uh, to the 1990s and to India, um, jumping across the world, there was the pneumonic plague. Um, and here uh, in eight states of India, like 5,000 cases of pneumonic bubonic plague uh, broke out. And in particular in the city of Surat, uh, you know, you know uh, over 500,000, 600,000 people fled the city, doctors fled, um, you know, countries severed trade, travel, other links with India, there was medication hoarding. That certainly there's some parallels there uh, to here, uh, to, to modern day. Um, a lot of um, so, you know, so-called psychological casualties, patients flooding hospitals with nonspecific symptoms, uh, afraid that they had contracted the plague and not surprisingly tourism declines, et cetera. This is a, a picture of people fleeing Surat. Now, uh, you know, I think in COVID-19, right, we have not here in the States and to the extent, as far as I know, seen anything quite like this around the world. Um, although the more I think about it, the more I certainly wonder, maybe you have too, uh, you know, about whether the, the Black Lives Matter protests would have um, broken out to the same degree uh, as they did uh, back in, in, the, in the spring, um, but for the pandemic. Um, you can even think about uh, on a, a different level, the, uh, a, I think a more troubling level would happen in Washington in early January, whether that in any sense was in any relation to the, to the pandemic, but that will be for sociologists to figure out in the years to come. So lessons learned, again, uh, same idea, be transparent and provide information and come out and do not hire. Right? These, these are lessons learned for, for governors. If you want, uh, for government, if you want people to behave rationally or as rationally as possible under great stress, um, you know, um, you gotta, you gotta be there in front of the mics and you gotta be telling the truths, et cetera. Jumping ahead to SARS, uh, something that uh, I think is some, uh, many of us may be a lot more, SARS COVID-1 that is uh, much more familiar with, uh, right? This broke out in Hong Kong and, and China uh, and then went to Hong Kong in so late 2002, um, early 2003. Uh, you know, starts in a hospital, moves uh, into the community and then peaks in April of 2003. Um, you know, um, there were of course some panic reactions, killing of pets in China, due to misinformation, uh, but that's something actually the Hong Kong Health Ministry was able to avert by getting out in front of it. Um, a lot of turning to alternative rem remedies and uh, you know, decisions from some schools to bar students um, from returning to school uh, from the Far East. Uh, you know, and you see, you know, and this certainly parallels with uh, what has gone on during um, the current pan the pandemic, long lines for face masks, disinfectants, supplies are exhausted. Um, lots of rumors, um, hoaxes regarding fake, fake, fake mask brands, snake oil solutions, soaps. There was um, some you know, widespread rumor about um, the use of wine vinegar, so that wine vinegar disappeared off the shelves. I'm not sure what would be the, the COVID-19 equivalent of that. Um, yeah, so people start isolating themselves, school children are kept home, sh you know, shopping, dining, drop out again. A lot of this probably was actually wise um, and whether it all happened by government mandate or not probably was um, good, some good choices that were being made. Um, and, you know, commercial areas become like ghost towns, right? So you, this uh, is starting to sound a lot more like um, what, we, what we are experiencing currently. Uh, now, these are some of the kind of uh, uh, rumors or, or that, that spread around uh, on, on the internet. Um, again, whether or not it was wise or not to completely avoid traveling to China or Hong Kong. Um, but looking at it from a specific mental health perspective, um, rather than just a behavioral perspective, there were a number of studies. This is where you begin to see, unlike in any of the prior uh, infectious outbreaks, this is where you actually begin to see research done 
uh, psychiatric research looking at the sequelae of, of the event. So we start to accumulate some data. So you could see uh, this was uh, from one relatively small study of 93 patients who had been treated for SARS at a, in Hong Kong at one hospital. And they, they looked at them, I guess, 30 months later, so two and a half years later. So you could see the rates of PTSD and major depression um, at, at, at that point. I think that was the point prevalence. And then the cumulative rate over, over the time, you could see almost in half the patients. And the, these writers talked about the idea that this was going to be a, a mental health catastrophe. And those, by the way, those, those rates, if they are correct, and I forget how they measure them, um, but um, those are extremely high rates. You know, lifetime prevalence of PTSD in the US is about 10%, for example. And uh, typical point prevalence for major depression in the US is probably like two to 3%, right? So these are much, much higher numbers. Uh, there was, of course, uh, concern about healthcare workers, much, you know, much like uh, we have uh, in COVID-19. Uh, and this is a study looking at Hong Kong respiratory staff one year later, and they had uh, elevated rates, not surprisingly, of general distress, post-traumatic symptoms, clinical depression, anxiety, compared to other hospital staff that was respiratory staff. And then looking at um, a Singapore hospital two months after um, their first SARS case, 20% of the staff had PTSD, 27% uh, would have what we call psychiatric caseness on a general kind of very broad mental health survey called the GHQ-28. Risk was reduced if people felt supported by their su supervisor or colleagues, or if they felt like they had clear information about the precautions to take. And we will see that echo in, in a moment into COVID-19. Uh, yeah, so I mean, some lessons that were taken away from SARS COVID-1. Um, it helps to have a CDC-like agency needed for coordination and communication. And we could probably preface that by saying an, an effective CDC-like agency. Um, they, they felt that there actually was a shortage of mental health counseling and that also that the media needs to be a little bit more responsible about the kinds of things that they transmit and the decisions they make of what to show. Now, uh, they have, there were a number, I showed you just a couple studies of, from, from SARS, um, uh, but uh, SARS-1, but uh, this is a study that came out in JAMA, I think in, in uh, this past spring. And what it looked at was um, SARS and also the Middle Eastern equine virus um, and, and compiled all the studies. So I think it was like a meta-analysis. So across all the studies that were done in SARS and MERS, you know, it was like 8,000, 2,000 plus people. And so they found a range of acute symptoms, none, none particularly surprising, but in, in, re, in recent, you know, recently affected, um, infected individuals, um, insomnia, concentration issues, anxiety, memory problems, depressed mood, confusion, emotional liability. Nothing surprising, although those are very large numbers, very large, you know, we're talking about about a third of, of patients. And then looking in the long term, going from like just, you know, in, in the, when we talk about mental health outcomes of traumatic events, disasters, um, we, you know, think about the acute, which is like days to weeks when you're not really talking about disorders unless someone has a recu recurrent disorder, it takes time right, for psychiatric issues to kind of um, coalesce and develop. But in the long term, um, in the, when you start talking about months to years, then you, of course, are talking about the possibility of psychiatric disorders, not isolated symptoms. So you could see here uh, clinical anxiety, which is a, actually rather broad, but it, it encompasses a number of psychiatric diagnoses like panic disorder or generalized anxiety. You see the, the pooled prev point prevalence, you know, three to 30 months later, 14.8%. You could see the pooled point prevalence for major depression, almost 15%. PTSD, really high, 32%. And um, so, you know, those are very, very high numbers. Um, and these are again, across all studies. And risk factors, um, female gender, which is something that comes up a lot in trauma studies, and the, the, the uh, basis for it is quite debated. Uh, being a healthcare worker, uh, having pain, having the death of a relative, um, uh, having prior chronic medical illnesses, and having any kind of medical legal involvement all increase people's risk. Okay, so now that brings us up to today um, and COVID-19. So COVID-19, um, you know, there are so many reasons to be concerned about its mental health impact. Um, and these are the ones that I could think of, right? There's having the illness itself. Um, there's fear of, fear of having the illness. Uh, there's exposure to death and dying at a level that uh, many have not seen in their lifetimes. 
most maybe have not. Uh, there's grief. Uh, there's disruptions in the mental health care system. There's the impact of quarantine and isolation. Um, there's the broad societal isolation uh, and the associated disruption in lifestyle. And then there's financial stress from the economic downturn. So all these things um, together do make one really concerned about the mental health impact of what we're going through right now. And, and there have been a lot of broad editorial comments, commentaries on COVID-19 and mental health. Again, as, you, as perhaps many of you have seen, there is a concern that we're going to have a, um, a mental health impact or in the, in the middle of, of, of one emerging, um, that there's uh, you know, going to be a, a sort of second wave of devastation that's going to be mental health um, when all the physical devastation winds down. Uh, there are concerns right about child and domestic abuse and interpersonal violence um, due to people having to uh, you know, stay home, shelter in place, that our system is gonna be overwhelmed, um, that, that, that it's gonna be necessary to do, you know, what we call so-called stepped care or integrated care, right? Integrating mental health into medical care. And um, I'm sure many of you have experience with that and have thoughts about that, but that is, of course is something that uh, we, I think, you know, we've been talking about um, as a profession and I think trying to do um, around the world really um, for a number of years. And there's a thought that this is really the time that if we haven't done it, we have to step on the gas and really do it in order to cover all the needs that are arising. Uh, and then there's something that you see after every single disaster um, and uh, which is you know, a, a call to action to better integrate mental health into pandemic planning, which is you know, always, there's always a sort of sense that mental health concerns are always listed in disaster planning of any sort. Um, because people, they know it's important, uh, they know it's the right thing to do, but then it doesn't really get much traction, it doesn't get much, there's not much in the way of details. Um, so then you always, you're always playing catch up every time a new event happens in terms of how to roll out um, effective mental health outreach. And then another issue is there are limits on clinical research um, in, right, you know, be, because of um, isolation and um, you know, social distancing, right, of course. Um, I think most uh, clinical research had been or has may still be to varying degrees shut down. And that's a real challenge for mental health because historically um, disaster related mental health research has always been about epidemiology, how much PTSD there is, how much depression, right? I showed you all those studies from SARS, COVID-1. I'll show you more from COVID-19. What you often don't get, tip, often rarely get actually are intervention studies. What are you supposed to do? Uh, and, and now with the limitations of clinical research, that's even more problematic. So I'm gonna talk about a few different populations um, and what we know about them uh, in terms of COVID-19, some of which aren't gonna be big surprises. Um, but uh, so this was a, a very big study that was done looking at the association between COVID-19 and mental illness in the US. And it looked at a, a database that was a collection of, of various healthcare organizations. Um, and it looked at, uh, so we're talking about, you know, 62,000 plus patients who had had COVID-19 between last January and this past August and examined them anywhere from two weeks to three months afterwards. And it compared patients with COVID-19 to patients with various other medical illnesses like influenza, respiratory infection, gallstones, real stones, skin infection, fracture. Um, and looked at the, the, the risk of uh, onset of psychiatric illness, uh, the, the, the relative risk of that uh, in light of each of these diagnoses and compared it with COVID-19. And um, the, by far the chance of diagnosis of any new onset psych illness was much higher in COVID-19 compared to any of these other medical conditions. And the incidence of having any psychiatric disorder following um, uh, uh, an episode of COVID-19 was 18%, and you know, almost 6% of those were new, new cases rather than recurrent cases. Risk was really high for having anxiety disorders, uh, insomnia, and actually even dementia, and somewhat elevated for mood disorders, but psychosis, there wasn't as so much of a risk. Um, on the other hand, uh, looking at the other direction, the relative risk of developing COVID-19 in patients with a prior psych diagnosis in, in I guess, 2019, the year prior, was 1.65. So you see, you see the risk going in both directions, which is, I think, pretty typical uh, for the interaction between medical and psych, which is they mutually influence one another. Uh, and these are just some, some graphs that, that lay, this, lay this out, I think, uh, graphically, um, the uh, kind of the peach 
colored uh, bars uh, lines are um, COVID-19 and the, the blue um, are the various um, different uh, d disorders. Whoops, sorry. Just trying to get something out of the way here. Um, yeah, so uh, like the, the top left is COVID-19 versus influenza um, and, and that's comparing um, uh, for any psych illness, the middle top is having any mood disorder, influenza versus COVID-19. And then the top right is anxiety disorder, any uh, uh, influenza versus COVID-19. Um, and then you could see some comparisons below um, uh, COVID-19 versus other respiratory infections. So you see just graphically, um, you know, without even getting into the stats, you could see that there's higher risk. Looking at post-traumatic stress disorder in particular, uh, and, and I should just say, you know, we, we often equate PTSD with going through a trauma, but uh, our traumas can lead to other conditions like major depression, substance use. Those are really the big three are PTSD, major depression, substance use, but we often hone in on PTSD. Um, and uh, of course it's the one, it's the well, pretty much with maybe one other exception, the only diagnosis in all of the DSM uh, that is actually tied to a, a, an etiology, in this case, a, a, a trauma, a stressor. Anyway, this is a study that looked at patients, um, 180 patients, so I guess a relatively small study, looking at post-traumatic stress on something called the Impact of Events Survey, the IES, and looked at them, um, uh, this was uh, one month out. And actually, um, they, they didn't find, they had found high levels of general stress, distress, not a big surprise, but in terms of PTSD on something called the PCL, the post-traumatic check, uh, PTSD symptom checklist, a very commonly used measure. It was only about 6.5%, not particularly high. But what they did find that there were much higher rates in ICU patients. And of course, in patients who initially had very, very high stress to begin with. Um, another study in Italy um, one month of patients um, who survived, um, somewhat larger study, um, finds rates that we might expect more typically, rates of PTSD 28%, um, depression 31%, clinical anxiety 42%, a lot of insomnia. This particular study tried to, to link uh, onset of psych illness with inflammatory response. Um, there's been a lot of discussion and research in the psych literature in recent years that trying to connect inflammatory response with psych issues. Um, and uh, in this case, they found only one parameter, the ratio of neutrophils um, and, to, and platelets to lymphocytes correlated with depression, anxiety, and sleep, but they didn't find a particularly strong signal otherwise. Um, now this, I show you the study, uh, I mean, you've probably long since gotten the point, right, that, um, that what we know intuitively is sort of being borne out in the psych literature, which is that you're seeing high rates of psych conditions um, in when, when, it, when we are doing studies on the, the epidemiology, the follow-up from having COVID-19. However, um, the prior studies I just showed you use self-report measures, right? Like the PHQ-9 that you may be familiar with, for example, to measure depression. Typically, we don't think of self-report measures as being anywhere close to a gold standard for making a psych diagnosis. Um, they're, you know, they're sort of their proxies. Um, you really have to have uh, uh, either clinical validation or use structured interviews. And that's why I show you this study. Uh, this is also out of Italy. It's from one, uh, one university hospital looking at um, uh, patients who'd been cared for there, almost 400 patients, and follows up one month to four months later. And it actually evaluated PTSD and major depression using structured interviews, right? So these are considered the gold standard in psych research. And you could see the rates of PTSD and major depress uh, any depressive disorder really high, right? So this is a especially credible study, although of course it's done at one place, one center. Uh, so that's a limitation, um, but it's um, certainly kind of uh, uh, daunting. And then one more study to show you, uh, this is out of China and there's been a ton of research that's come out of China. Um, uh, uh, since uh, the onset of the pandemic. And this is just an important study because it was done at six months. So it's the longest follow-up study that I could find so far in the mental health sequelae. And actually they looked at the physical sequelae as well. And they found you know, super high rates of lingering fatigue and muscle weakness, which from talking with my patients and I think from all we know and talking with people I know, this is a, certainly a very common uh, problem in so-called long haulers. Um, 
but you also see very high rates of sleep difficulties and anxiety or depression. So a fairly large sample, again, uh, just from one hospital, um, but um, a six month follow-up, um, which is notable. Interestingly, um, they found, uh, or maybe distressingly, they found significantly lower antibodies at six months too, but I guess we increasingly know that the antibody titers seem to drop off over time, at least from natural immunity. So those are, that's about patients, um, you know, survivors. What about the, wide, the, the wider community impact of, of COVID-19 on mental health? Well, now these, this is an online survey from Turkey. Of course, the online survey has, is hardly a random sample. Um, and, uh, but nonetheless, uh, what they found are very high rates of depression, anxiety, and, uh, amongst, uh, and, and health anxiety, not surprisingly, amongst people that responded and um, you could see some of the risk factors, uh, again, um, female gender, um, knowing somebody that had COVID-19, um, having a prior psych history, not, no, nothing that we didn't already kind of know from before about risk factors, um, uh, but more of the same out of China. Now, this is also an online survey, but it actually, uh, I forget how they did it, but they, they were able, they captured like 56,000 uh, responses and they actually captured all 34 provinces. So um, a, a much bigger study and a much, you know, study that I think you can even take even more seriously than the, the one from Turkey. And you see fairly high rates of depression. Again, these aren't self reports, so that, that's a limiting factor, but you know, fairly high rates of de depression, um, anxiety, quite high, acute stress disorder, which is the sort of the precursor to PTSD. Um, and you could see risk factors, um, you know, um, Again, knowing someone that had COVID-19, um, living in Hubei, like right at the so-called epicenter at the time, uh, having gone through quarantine and having delays in return to work. Now, this is an interesting study. I'm not gonna show you all the details. Um, and I have to admit, I probably barely understand all the, all the math that they did and the calculations, but what they, this is done in the US and they took a look at the mortality data, demographics, and they used something called simulated kinship networks and what the researchers um, uh, figured out, uh, calculated, uh, was that on average for every COVID-19 death, there are about nine people that will be bereaved, uh, will be left bereaved. Um, and it sort of depends upon uh, where the person was in the family, a grandparent, parent, et cetera, right? But that's a lot of people. Um, if you think about that, we uh, just right hit the 500,000 mark um, and you multiply that by on average nine people, that's a lot of people that are, are touched uh, just from the perspective of, of bereavement, which of course is a natural thing, but is also a painful thing. Um, and sometimes can be um, develop into complicated grief or other issues. This is a study uh, uh, looking just a little bit at child mental health uh, out of China. And it bears on the whole, I think, discussion about you know, open or closed uh, in-person schooling. Uh, so in this uh, particular uh, city in China, they actually had pre-pandemic mental health information about their school kids. And these were fourth to eighth graders. So they had mental health surveys from November 2019, just before schools were closed in China. Uh, and then they repeated the survey in May in the same city after the schools were reopened. And you could see uh, the pre-pandemic to post uh, or pre-school closure to post-school closure numbers all go up in a significant fashion. Um, anxiety symptoms, for whatever reason, were not uh, statistically significant in their increase, but they all went up, um, including suicidality, unfortunately. Um, somewhat distressingly, actually, if you just take the numbers on the left, the pre-pandemic numbers, those are pretty high to begin with, uh, uh, kind of distressingly, but you can see the, the big jumps. And right, so this is really felt to ref, you know reflect on a concern that many people have had, um, at least one of the concerns about uh, school closure is the, the mental health impact on kids. And we're certainly hearing about that more in the news. Healthcare workers. So um, looking at ourselves um, um, and particularly at uh, you know, those of us who've been on the front line. Uh, this is from China, a study that was about two thirds nurses, one third physicians super high rates of depression, anxiety, insomnia, uh, general distress, like really high. And risk factors, again, you see uh, being a woman, actually being a nurse, which came up a lot in SARS-CoV-1, right? The idea that nurses are highly exposed uh, 
uh, simply by the amount of exposure they have on, on the units. Being a frontline worker, not a surprise, and being in Wuhan right at the, at the center of things. Here at Sinai, uh, and some of you may well have participated in this survey, and we now actually have a recent follow-up survey, the, the data for which has been calculated but not released. Um, uh, John Ripp, um, our Dean for uh, uh, Wellbeing and Resilience, um, did a study where he uh, was able to capture oh, 2,500 Mount Sinai uh, clinical workers. Uh, I think it was uh, it's physicians, nurses, uh, PAs, nutritionists, social workers, I think those are the, the, the bulk of them, looking at symptoms of COVID-19 related mental health issues, personal factors, COVID-19 exposures and protective factors. And you could see, uh, yeah, so the response rate was over 50%, which is pretty darn good. Uh, and then and when they clean the data, they're able to uh, use like about three quarters of the responses. And you can see um, on the right, uh, the rates of MDD is major depressive disorder, GAD, generalized anxiety disorder, and PTSD. You can see rates that hover around a quarter in all the respondents. The left is shows that a number of the, excuse me, a number of the respondents had more than one condition. Um, so that's troubling. Um, uh, and of course, these are on self-report measures. Um, looking at risk factors, um, uh, pre-pandemic burnout was found to be a risk factor, right? And that's, you know, ph physician, clinician burnout, right? as you probably all know, and maybe uh, perhaps even experience, uh, has been something that's been getting a lot of attention in the medical field and not surprisingly uh, pre-pandemic. So work was being trying to put in place to reduce that, but nonetheless, the presence of that or the presence of having work-life balance challenges in one's life um, all made, made it much more likely that um, our fellow colleagues here at Sinai um, were likely to develop PTSD, et cetera. Lack of adequate PPE uh, was a risk factor for PTSD. Um, being, you know, having a colleague who died um, or a colleague that was hospitalized were also risk factors. A protective factor, right? And this was seen, again, if you think back to the, the study, one of the studies I mentioned on, on SARS COVID 1, uh, uh, feeling su supported by hospital leaders ha has, was found to be a protective factor. Um, so that it continues to be a big deal, I think, within the idea of support from above, trusting those above you, whether it's in the hospital hierarchy or even in society and in government, really does make a big difference. Uh, and non-physicians were more likely to screen positively uh, for at least one of the mental health disorders, which is consistent with the, that data out of China. Um, and in this case, non-physicians prob probably uh, hones in particularly on nursing staff that are so highly exposed. Um, one, one mention, uh, John Ripp just completed a follow-up study and the numbers have come down. Um, and, and again, they found that support from leadership was actually correlated with reductions in the numbers. Those numbers are still high, but the prevalence of, of the various disorders are not as bad as they were back in, in the spring when this was done. So that's encouraging. Okay, to look specifically at suicidality. And suicidality is something that always comes up in times of disaster. People worry so much that there's gonna be elevated suicide rates. And in fact, on, on the right, as it says, that is historically, despite this uh, you know, recurrent fear, have actually uh, never, to my knowledge, been demonstrated to cause increases in suicide attempts. Now they may cause some increase in suicidal thinking, questions about the point to life or going on or existential questions, um, but actually increases in suicide rates and attempts um, have ne never, uh, I've never found a study that demonstrated that. And in fact, some studies have actually found historically that there have been decreases in suicide rates. Uh, however, in COVID-19, there are reasons to think again, because of the whole kind of uh, mix of, of risks that, uh, that oppose this to mental health, this may be different. And, and, and of course, we don't know from, let's say, from the 1918 flu pandemic, whether suicidality went up because it wasn't studied. Um, but, uh, predictors of reasons we might think that suicidality is going to go up in COVID-19. Um, at the very top is unemployment. If there is one type of catastrophe that we do know tends to increase risk of suicide, it's financial ones. Um, and so the, the economic crisis and unemployment rates may, may make this one different. But again, there's, um, there's of course, the, the, what seems like we're already capturing the signal of increased, increased rates of mental health problems or substance use problems. Uh, you know, concerns about right um, um, more substance use and more dangerous substance use um, um, 
such as opioids, people staying home, there's social isolation, the effect of that. There's decreased access to community and religious institutions, which have a big role in providing support uh, disruptions in the mental health care system, and then increased access to means, because I believe gun sales have increased in the US during the time of the pandemic. So for all these reasons, this time may be different, unfortunately. Um, some of the data so far that we see on suicidality has actually been mixed, though. Uh, a Columbia University study done back in the spring looking at Google, Google searches for suicide-related terms to the extent that those correlate with attempts um, actually um, were lower than expected, right? There was actually a decrease compared to prior uh, comparable periods. Um, although terms actually associated with mental health care seeking actually went up, which was good. On the other hand, a, a small study out of India um, uh, among psychotherapists found that 65% of them reported an increase in suicidality. Although I have to say right there, thankfully is a difference between suicidal thinking and suicidal behavior. Um, now, but now there are beginning to see some studies that do suggest a, a, a increased risk of suicide, mortal, suicide mortality. Um, and here, this is out of Maryland. Um, they studied the, uh, when the, the state was gonna you know, close down and they, they compared uh, suicide rates during that period of closure compared to the average suicide rates in that same time period uh, in the prior three years, right? And they found that the rates of suicide um, mortality actually doubled in, in black residents. Meanwhile, decreased by half in white residents um, and actually remained decreased for the white residents uh, in the two months after reopening. And there's lots of, you know, uh, kind of post, you know, postulating why this is, but this, of course, you know, intersects with the Black Lives Matter movement potentially in terms of how we understand the risks, all the risks that have uh, uh, been posed to, um, to minority groups during the pandemic and beyond. Um, so there's a couple of notable things about the survey, even if it's a small survey study, it's, it's, it's suggestive. And then a study that just came out of Japan last week, and actually there was a front cover story in the New York Times, I think a couple of days ago about uh, suicide rates in, in women in Japan. And then I, I didn't see what their sources were. I don't know if it was the study, but um, Japan, which already had extremely high rates of suicide anyway, pre-pandemic, um, looking at their national suicide rates um, over you know, April, November, and um, uh, 2020 compared to the prior four-year averages, men increased for much of the, for part of this period, the rates, and women increased um, um, in an even longer period from July through November. So, you know, there are national level increased rates in Japan. So there are reasons to expect increased suicidality. And uh, unfortunately, there's beginning to be data that suggests that. And, and if you think back to that study from China on school kids, that was suggestive as well. You know what to do about all this. Well, um, I guess I only have a few minutes to talk more about this. But um, you know, as I said, you know, treatment treatment studies are always in short short supply during disasters. Uh, this time it's been a little bit different. Actually, you are seeing a bit more treatment studies, so that's a hopeful part of the pandemic because I think so many people have been affected that there's more resources available. As you may know, there's been some suggestion that fluvoxamine and SSRI that we, we usually use for OCD um, because it, it, it its effect. Um, is an agonist at the sigma-1 receptor, which I admit I'd never heard of before, but um, is, uh, I guess, on the endoplasmic reticulum of cells and is part of the whole cascade of events uh, by which um, the coronavirus um, uh, does its, uh, infects cells and, and multiplies. Um, because of that, fluvoxamine has been studied. And it did show that um, in, a, in a randomized study that receiving fluvoxamine um, prevented deterioration in, um, in the treatment arm compared to uh, controls. And I think there are larger studies going on now looking at fluvoxamine in particular. Uh, there, there was a large study out of Paris across a number of university hospitals looking at all antidepressants in COVID-19. And they found that, and, and the rationale here was that antidepressants have been associated with reduced inflammatory response or that, for example, depression is associated with increased inflammatory response. So putting that together with the idea that there's you know, this big infl inflammatory gush in, um, uh, in uh, COVID-19 illness, um, they reason out, okay, maybe, maybe being on antidepressant is protective. And actually that is what they found. The risk of death or intubation re was reduced um, based on being on uh, any antidepressant versus none, and particularly on SSRIs and some, um, some non-SSRIs. 
and in particular, the signal was picked up for fluoxetine, uh, you know, Prozac, Paxil, Lexapro, Effexor, and Remeron. Um, a little study, surprise that my phone has not been ringing off the hook. Um, and I don't know what we can take away from the study because of course, I already said earlier that having a mental illness puts you at risk for COVID-19. Um, and certainly I have to say clinically, many of my patients, mo most of whom are on antidepressants have been getting sick from COVID-19 anyway. Uh, so I don't know what to take away from that. Uh, just there are, I don't have time to go into detail, but there actually have been a, a bunch of small studies looking at the uh, teaching patients who admit to hospital progressive muscle relaxation. Um, and that has actually reduced uh, anxiety and improved sleep in, in, in these small studies, um, which they actually did in a controlled fashion. Um, I think it was controlled. Um, teaching patients in China about an online, online self-help intervention um, where that involved relaxation exercises, mindfulness, um, something called the butterfly hug method, which is this, so you kind of more or less kind of hug yourself. Um, and that these methods actually uh, reduced um, uh, rates of anxiety and depression in these patients. And, uh, and also brief psychological interventions with a psychologist and getting a little bit fancier also um, uh, reduced um, rates of clinical depression anxiety. So there've been some small studies, this one is out of Iran, um, um, showing that some fairly low tech interventions actually may actually reduce uh, the risk of psychiatric sequelae from having COVID-19. Okay, um, concluding. Um, so COVID-19 compared to past infectious outbreaks, uh, it seems on the whole that we've had more social cohesion. Um, I guess you can talk about that in different ways. It's, from To my eyes and ears, it seems that way. Um, there is a comparable risk to healthcare workers, at least compared to SARS COVID-1 that we know about. Um, there may well be greater suicide risk um, certainly compared to disaster, or possibly compared to disasters in general. And again, we don't know about suicide during other massive outbreaks because it simply wasn't studied and reported. Um, it seems that there's gonna be a more, uh, more uh, prominent role for psychiatry um, compared to um, other disasters, um, not because other disasters haven't had the need because there's, I guess, more attention. And um, you know, one thing, that I, one bullet that I left off of this is the role of telepsychiatry. Um, it's been, I think, um, something I was doing a fair amount of before, uh, but most of, most of my colleagues were not, but it's been tremendous in terms of maintaining continuity of care. And there's tons of evidence to suggest that tele, tele mental health is as effective. Um, so that has been a real boon for improving access. So that's a positive side of the pandemic so far, and hopefully we'll, um, outlast the pandemic in terms of people utilizing it more in terms of also reducing government uh, regulations that limit uh, interstate use of telepsych. Um, we do need more intervention research. Um, actually, those last two bullets are a bit redundant. More intervention research. Um, but there, it is promising that during this pandemic, people have begun to study, study again, fairly low tech interventions um, in addition to those anti antidepressant studies. Um, um, and so we might learn a lot more this time about how to do what has always been sort of the holy grail of disaster mental health services and research, which is find things that you could do to intervene early so that people's expectable stress, perhaps normal stress and distress doesn't become a psychiatric disorder like PTSD. Okay, uh, that is my talk, hopefully not too fast, but wanted to get it all in and I guess I can take questions. Thank you very much, Dr. Katz. Um, so now we're going to open the, the floor to anyone who has any questions or comments. Please, before you pose your question, just identify yourself, the department you work in, or with which type of patients you work, so we're all aware. Um, or you can also type in the chat if you don't want to or cannot unmute yourself. Dr. Katz, thank you for a really wonderful talk. And I, I think I probably speak for everyone in the audience. It's always so insightful to, to get a sense of the history. A little bit of an unfair question for you, but I can't help but ask. In your survey and research, do you think we do in fact learn from past experience and that in, then informs how we move forward? Uh, it's a, thank you, uh, Dr. Sir. That's a really good question. Um, um, I actually have to say, um, 
that we don't always learn um, from from uh, past events. I think um, it seems like each time we sort of feel like when something bad happens, like we're starting new and everyone runs around with their hands up in the air saying, we got to do something different this time and next time. And then it doesn't, it doesn't happen. I, you know, I, you know, we often have short memories. Um, I, I, I th I'm thinking maybe this time will be a little bit different because at least with disasters, usually, you know, they're thankfully relatively localized, you know, uh, New York City kind of, and I guess DC, when you think about 9-11, you know, certain places kind of own it. Um, Oklahoma City bombing, it was down in Oklahoma City, but this is everybody. And so uh, I'm hoping that the things that we learn this time, um, one week that we'll simply learn more, that there's be more volume of learning and that um, we will, um, because we have so much more research coming out of this, that it won't just be stuff that fills journal pages, but that actually will be translated into practice. So I'm, I'm actually, that's one thing I'm a little bit more hopeful about this time. Dr. Katz, it's uh, Doreen Mensa, Internal Medicine. Um, wonderful talk. Question for you. Um, given the pandemic and our inability to uh, be close and hence have to do a lot of telemedicine um, or telehealth for psychiatry, what do we do with the large population of patients with quite advanced um, psychological disorders who might not have access to a phone to do um, telehealth? with your provider, and then you have the centers closed down because of the pandemic situation. I worry that we have a large pool of existing patients who would then fall through the cracks and become more of an issue down the stream for us. Thank you. Um, thank you for your question. Um, well, I mean, I think, you know, we've, we've I have some experience in uh, EHOP, which is our student-run uh, faculty-facilitated uh, health clinic, um, where I, I oversee the mental health clinic there that we have integrated into it. And so there we have, you know, really marginalized patients. Um, you know, many of whom, th you know, thankfully we don't treat like chronic psychotic disorders, so we don't treat the most severely mentally ill, but we treat so some so really marginalized individuals, and. Um, and we've been doing all telemental health uh, throughout, and this is really students delivering the care. And you know, we've had far less no-show rates and been able to reach them, even if we're doing it on phone. And uh, you know, I mean, um, almost, most people have a phone, and uh, thankfully. And uh, I actually, in my own experience, feel like phone does work reasonably well for mental health. Not all patients like it. I think sometimes it actually works better than video. I think some patients relax more and are more open actually without the visuals. Um, so I actually think we're able with using different types of technology to reach, to reach most everybody. Um, there is some concern though, you know, for the severely mentally ill about their ability to, to navigate all this and um, just to do the planning to be available um, and be online or, or be on their phone. You know, and, it, and that might be a place where, you know, mobile crisis teams or ACT teams, assertive community treatment teams that do go out into the community do have a role and, um, and, and can outreach to them. And, um, uh, and so that, that may well fill in the cracks. Although I know, I don't know if it's changed. They, they were out also themselves operating remotely for a while. Um, but uh, I think that would be one way to, to fill in the gaps. And I also, I mean, this is, this is a place for government funding, et cetera. You know, if we can, Get you know funding or or found it, private funding, charitable funding to pay for smartphones for people uh, that will improve their mental health care. Uh, you know that's going to that's going to be money very well spent for society. Thank you, Dr. Katz. Um, this is Robert Bernstein. I'm an endocrinologist, but I'm asking this question as a grandfather. Have there been any studies or any uh, literature? on the effects of whether schools are closed or open on mental health in children? Uh, the, the one study that I know of is uh, one that I, I made some reference to in China, but not, I, don't, I don't know of any studies yet that have been done in the States. I know, you know there have been reports, I think out of uh, Nevada uh, about increased rates of, of suicide in kids. Um, there's been a lot of anecdotal stuff, but nothing formally out of the States that I've been able to find. But I, it, it's 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 coming, and it's hard to imagine it's not going to show more more distress. Um, 
we'll see about the, hopefully it won't bear out the, the issue of, of suicidality being increased, but we'll see. Bob, just to point out, and, and um, I, I believe we'll have the ability to go back and look at Dr. Katz's slides, which we're always grateful for. He did show that China study was really pretty rigorous, it seemed, where they, they looked at pre-pandemic rates and then post. And so I think there certainly are things to learn from that. Yeah, and, and just to, to um, um, recall that, the details, all of the all the rates of everything anxiety depression suicidal thinking and unfortunately suicidal behavior all went up um, statistics, statistically significantly pre-school closure to post-school closure in china in this particular city uh although the, the anxiety was not statistically significant for some reason well my particular question was that because of the hodgepodge of regulations in this country schools are closed in some areas and open in other areas and whether there's any difference in terms of mental health problems and what kinds of mental health problems for the kids who did go back to school and the kids who didn't. Yeah, well, I mean, that's a, that's a, a beautiful and important study to do and looking at all the potential stressors that kids experience being home versus being in school um, in this time. And uh, I don't know, but I'm sure somebody is out there doing that study right now and you know, maybe we'll get together in six months or a year and take a look at that data. Uh, this is Dr. Prigolini. I'm part of the residency program, the leadership. And the impression that I have is it's all, of course, concerning to see, you know, the impact on mental health that this has. And as part of the leadership, you know, we offer uh, uh, our resources for mental health and you know, the truth is, I don't know exactly how much those are used. Then on the other hand, I am doing a research study on trainees uh, who were redeployed uh, during the COVID pandemic. And some of the answers that we get is after having this interview on their experience, uh, they're extremely thankful for having that opportunity and how useful it was uh, to debrief uh, during the interview. And the impression that I have is that you know, what do you think is the best way to offer uh, space to reflect on this? My impression is that when we offer it as something imposed, it doesn't work. People don't want to participate in it. And yet when they do have the opportunity, they are so thankful for it. So I don't know what your suggestion is as to how to make this more available or more appetizing for our trainees. Uh, thank you. Uh, and I'm really glad that you're doing that study. Um, I, I agree. Usually when you set up, often when you set up groups, et cetera, and you, you know, people don't show up, um, you know, support, uh, you know, kind of quick support services often doesn't happen. I'd like to think though that that setting them up itself just sends a good message and makes people feel supported, even if they don't access the services. I can't prove that, but it seems like it's uh, must, must be the case. You know, I think um, one, I mean, a, a couple of thoughts is one is, potentially, you know, some people are reluctant to get care within the institution. So linking up with outside services like the Medical Society of State of New York has something called peer to peer, um, where people can connect with, you know, a, a physician, a fellow physician, almost certainly outside of their institution, and it's available for students and, and residents. So that's one way to go. Although I have to say that's being underutilized also. I mean, physicians are a tough nut to crack, um, you know, getting us to show up. We really are, so to speak. Um, but um, another thing is the idea of using um, something from the military, you know, so-called battle buddies, which is pairing up everybody with a with a, a colleague, a fellow resident, or even a fellow faculty member, to do check-ins. You know, just to to put make it part of your culture that you check in with one another. We're actually uh, uh, my colleagues uh, in our new pandemic mental health center are we're about to roll out a, a, a program like that with some nurses on nursing units, uh, and the military uses this to. Uh, I don't think they've actually really studied its impact, but they've historically used it quite a bit and it seems like good practice. So that is another very low tech way to go. Um, I also find that when you, if you give talks and in, like on mental health, people come up afterwards and that's when they seek services uh, in a sense, or they ask questions. Um, so, um, you know, you kind of create those inf informal ways that people can, can come up and, and do it. So those, those are some of my thoughts, but it is, it is, it is tough. I, I, I fully agree. <laughs>
I, the, cult, the culture of medicine needs to change. It's 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 mm -hmm. it's a little bit bigger than any uh, any any one the, the technicalities of any one program. I think. Yeah. Thanks. Yeah. Dr. Katz, I think we have time for one more question. We have a question in the chat, and I think the answer is going to be quick. Uh, uh, Dr. Shruti Anand, one of our senior residents, is asking, you know, if there are any studies examining mental health impact on immigrant communities, both legal and undocumented immigrants, or she also asks on immigrant physicians. Uh, thank you. I'm sorry I didn't see that question. Uh, very briefly, um, I'm not the only one actually I'm aware of is a study that we did with our own immigrant population in our student run clinic. We did a publication about uh, our outreach to them and their ability to access services, but we have no comparison groups. So we, we can't compare the relative impact, immigrant versus non-immigrant, et cetera. But you've got to think in, in the current political climate, hopefully improving, uh, that there's gonna be a much, much bigger impact um, for so many reasons, but no data that I've seen. Dr. Katz, thank you so much again for a really great talk. And it certainly warms my heart. And I imagine everyone in the audience heart to know that you're out doing the wonderful work that you're doing. And we learned so much. So thank you. Thank you, Dr. Seward. And thank you uh, for having me. I really appreciate it. And take good care. You too. Bye. You thank too. you. Bye -bye.